year or next year we get to see each other in person mm -hmm. or in one of the conferences or even in the you know one of the classes um uh just a little bit of background uh first of all i think i'm also part of the you know the ucsc the advisory board i think super excited about this program i think if you have noticed anything in the last three four years the trend in the industry in general in research and you know academia for nlp is like spiked like crazy right i think we were relying on these statistical models for a couple of decades but it's only now that we're starting to see it percolate to pretty much every problem at hand right and nlp is once again research so i think very exciting times um, just a little bit of background about myself. Um, so my background is, uh, you know, NLP, I got my PhD in, in like focus on machine learning. I spent most of my career at Google. I started and led uh, several of the machine learning groups at Google. I founded the large scale machine learning platforms that are now running search and ads and pretty much 100 plus products across Google that does the core ranking, et cetera, using semi-supervised learning, learning on the cloud and uh, also conversational AI. I'll talk about some of that stuff, uh, you know, later down the presentation on how do you do generation, especially, you know, with the sequence models, et cetera, and like make that available and to do that at a billion scale and what, it, what does it take? Um, one note, uh, there's a lot of stuff, uh, you know, we're talking about like, you know, doing computation on the cloud. But a lot of my work towards uh, the last four or five years when I was at Google was also on how do you bring that on more efficient devices, computer and memory constrained devices, right? How do you do on-device machine learning? So I actually started uh, several efforts in this. And now um, we've seen a lot more activity in this area, privacy preserving ML, you know, on-device ML uh, in the industry and academic settings, um, super important problems. Some of what I'm talking about today will also touch on that. Um, and like over more than a year ago, um, I joined Amazon Alexa and Alexa, I'm actually leading the multi-model conversational AI effort. So if you're asking Alexa anything about, you know, any questions or like you're getting the, your new snippets, et cetera, um, you know, the experiences that are coming out through the, whether it's on a device with a display or not, these are experiences that are built by my team, the machine learning that goes on under the hood. And also, how do we do end-to-end -end machine learning in the context of conversational AI? Um, so I'll sprinkle a bunch of examples along the way. But the topic for today, just to give you a sense, is that um, I, is one that I feel is important, not just from computer science or NLP or computer vision perspective. It's a sort of an underlying paradigm, right? Um, and the title of the talk is Large Scale Neural Graph Learning. But I will give you, a, you know, sort of a walkthrough of our experiences on through the teams that I built, both at Google and in Amazon, and even, uh, you know, what other folks are doing externally, both in industry and academia, on how do you compute with structured information, right? That's the premise of the talk. And I'll talk about like why, you know, and how, you know, uh, machine learning uh, done with structured data as input is actually very uh, critical to getting uh, many of the you know problems right and solving the problems and also making them usable right I mean, when we're seeing um, these technologies being deployed in the real world and then i'll move on to how do you scale that to large settings large data settings more complex tasks with minimal annotations minimal supervision um, there's a new paradigm that we introduced called neural structured learning, and this fits with neural graph learning and uh, several other types of uh, learning, like adversarial methods, etc. And finally, I'll talk about like how the neural structured learning framework, you know, sort of applies to NLP and our work in the space for knowledge graph applications and um, you know multi-document summarization, etc. Feel free to ask me any questions at any point. By the way, uh, if you were in person, I would tell you like, hey, I love to keep it interactive <laughs> here. I can probably see some of your faces pop up on the screen, but just uh, if you have any questions, just interrupt me. Um, okay, uh, so like, first of all, um, I mean, you are uh, NLP folks, so I think this should not come as a surprise to you, uh, but let me give you a little bit of motivation why uh, when we talk about, at least in throughout like my work in this space and my team's work in the space, uh, why when we talk about structure, uh, we try to model that structure using the notion of graphs. So graphs are a 
pretty much a very natural and powerful formalism to express any kind of relationships between any type of objects. Now you can take like an object being like, I mean, think of a graph. I mean, everybody understands the concept of graphs, right? There are nodes and there are edges which capture relationships between those nodes. The node can be represented by simple phrases. Like in the bottom left, you see a semantic intent graph. Basically this subgraph is representing, hey, if I see an edge between two nodes, that just means that they capture the same semantics. So buy car and purchase vehicle are sort of capturing the same semantics. You can take the same notion and replace the nodes with images like visual content. And here you would have an image similarity graph, right? Um, and that captures like the semantics of the image. Uh, basically, visually, when I look at two different cars, they kind of look very similar, right? So that's the property it's capturing. And you can extend this all the way to more natural graphs, like the famous examples are the social networks, right? I mean, your Facebooks or your WhatsApp or any of the, you know, even maybe your in the context of video conferencing, right? I mean, who do you interact with and who do you make video conference calls with, right? So that expresses a different type of interaction, the relationship between the objects. Uh, but at the bottom line is that they allow you to capture this sort of flexible and very uh, heterogeneous type of relationships in a very simple manner, right? If you had to, like a counter example would be, if, if I say, hey, take these subgraphs and try to express it mathematically or in a different form, you might have to encode a, a gazillion features or, you know, sort of like a very, very rich representation to actually write down what like by car and how that equates to the same thing as saying purchase vehicle, right? So. Uh, now you just take a look at this three node graph and you say, oh, I understand what this is capturing, right? So to a, to a human at least. I haven't told you how we get the graphs up. That is like coming up later. So essentially <clears throat> um, what we've done in our work is like <clears throat> flip the idea of uh, just feeding in graphs and trying to do some reasoning over graphs and look at graphs as basically ML computing engines. And <clears throat> to do that, there are two ways. So on the left you see, the core property of a graph is it helps capture structure and data. On the right hand, any ML model, whether you have deep networks or probabilistic models or you know, even rule-based systems, what they're trying to do is learn some predictive functions. You get some input XIs and you're trying to predict some YIs. YIs can be classes, YI can be sequences, YI can be even you know, sort of in the generative sense of things like other data types, right? XI primes. So all you're trying to do is learn a predictive function. So we can transform data that we see in any application or any use case uh, into a graph where we say that, hey, there are two nodes are connected, basically depending on some type of relationship uh, expressed between them. And the edge weight basically captures the strength of the connection, right? And the label on each node is basically the predictive property that you want to you know, sort of uh, learn automatically or from data or via some other source. Now take a standard example, supervised learning example, where you're saying you're given a bunch of features and you're trying to predict uh, the category, right? I mean, for example, you are given a document and you want to predict the, uh, the type of document it is, right? Does it belong to a sports category or does it belong to a business category? Or I mean, the simple classification problem. So you can use a, uh, formulate this as a graph problem where you say you have a bipartite graph. On the one hand, you have instances, excise, on the other hand, you have feature nodes and the connection between the feature nodes and the uh, instances are basically membership, right? So if I one connected to XI means, okay, that I observe that feature, right? So this is a very nice and sparse way of, you know, sort of capturing features uh, and relationship between feature and instances. At the same time, you can also have edges between feature nodes themselves. Two features might be correlated, right? I mean, basically if I say the property of like, whether uh, I applied for a loan and whether, you know, so I have an account in a specific, you know, uh, bank, uh, you know, or a specific type of checking account. I mean, these are sort of correlated properties, right? I mean, these sort of relationships uh, can also be expressed as strength um, in terms of edge weights. Uh, and voila, now your problem now becomes from this bipartite graph, you can define a loss function over the instances that say that, I have a bunch of observed pair of examples, XIs and YIs. I'm going to use this subgraph the, with the feature connections in order to learn a predictive property that says, hey, given any XI that I can embed into this graph and with its own set of feature nodes, predict the corresponding YI labels. 
So you might not be used to thinking of like supervised learning problems in this way. There are advantages to this. As I said, the biggest advantage is now XI, not all XIs need to be labeled. Not all feature nodes need to be present. So you can have incomplete features. Most importantly, you can start now uh, defining very complex correlation between feature nodes and uh, you know, the instances and also relationship between different instances as well. Um, so this applies to classification, regression problems, and you know, any type of supervised pro uh, learning problem. On the other hand, you can also formulate uns unsupervised learning problems in the same way. Same thing, you have now instances, uh, you know, XIs, XKs, and uh, XJs, and these are connected via some edges. And you're now defining a loss function where you're saying, learn a set of parameters, F theta, which transforms XI and its neighborhood, like the, you know, the MACAL N over XI is just representing the corresponding neighborhood of XI. And you're taking these two uh, inputs and predicting a, some membership or some other property. So in the classic sense of representation learning, imagine thinking of like anything from your word to vec to glove embeddings to any sort of embedding methods, right? What you're trying to say is that, oh, I'm given uh, a node or a phrase and a set of nearby phrases, and I'm now trying to predict what the, you know, the corresponding embedding uh, should be for XI, right? Such that it captures the similarity properties with my neighbors. Um, why, why did, do, do we do all this, right? I mean, you, why can't you just say, let's do standard logistic regression or any other standard supervised learning methods, right? Um, one of the primary motivations is like supervised learning, everybody's familiar with it. Like you give a bunch of examples of input output examples, and then you're trying to learn an ML model. It doesn't matter what the model here is. Uh, the problem is it's usually the labels on those examples are very hard to obtain. And think of like at scale, um, when we're talking about, you know, doing image recognition or classification or even complex uh, sequence labeling tasks, right? I mean, for example, in the case of Alexa or assistance, um, you need to have a lot of label data to get the quality of predictions really high, right? We're not talking about a few thousands of examples. Quite often that requires a lot of work, time, resources, and with the increase in complexity of the task, that means you go from simple binary classification to you know, uh, regression to like multi-way classification to sequence labeling. As the complexity increases, the cost of labeling also increases significantly. So uh, how do we actually get around this, right? So in the case of conversational AI, right? For example, you're talking about uh, how do we sort of build ML models for virtual assistants? Uh, those conversations and utterances, right, that uh, typical users like are used to talking to the, their assistants and, you know, sort of providing as input are often ambiguous, right? Without all the other contexts, right, it can be very hard to parse for a machine. You as a human might actually hear that one small phrase, hey, uh, turn on this, right, or turn on that light or whatever it is, right? I mean, you might be able to parse it quickly, right? But for a machine to actually take that short phrase and convert it into an action, uh, without all the other surrounding context, it's uh, usually very hard, right? So we need to sort of disambiguate and um, do this in a much more efficient manner. And the solution is basically this, right? You have tons of unlabeled data. You don't need a lot of like, you know, millions or billions of labeled example. You have tons of unlabeled data, natural language. This is the beauty of it, right? We have a lot of text on the web and other places. You can, if you can combine that with minimal supervision, that means a few of those examples are annotated, right? With, for whatever task you have. And then you can exploit the structure in the data, which we model using graphs. Then you can create a very viable mechanism that actually can sort of scale to large amounts of data, more complex tasks, and also across different modalities, right? And so this is the key recipe that uh, we'll follow in this talk. I'll give you, you know, with increasing complexity of how we apply this to different problems. Um, just as an example, so this allows us to, you know, in the standard literature, this would be what we call like semi-supervised, right? But the for the oldest time, right, it was known that, oh, semi-supervised is great when it was first introduced, but if you, we should probably add like 10x more supervised data and, you know, you don't see the wins. This has changed dramatically in the last 10, 15 years, and especially work from, you know, our group and like follow-up works, et cetera. Um, because the kind of problems we're dealing with now are not simple, you know, sort of toy classification problems, right? Um, so essentially what we are trying to do is semi-supervised graph uh, machine learning and do this at 
like really large scale do this very, very efficiently. So here's an example. Uh, here's an image similarity graph. Before the learning process, I only give you one example for each concept, like car and line, and I tag that. And the goal is after this process, you want to learn a probability distribution over these two concepts for every image in the graph. And if you look intuitively uh, what happens, right? I mean, like why these scores are um, the way they are, uh, because car on the left is tightly connected to car on the middle image, right? Which is labeled. So as a result, because of the strength of the connection, we can induce a probability distribution. Hey, these two are looking very similar. So they should probably share the same label versus the bottom, uh, you see the uh, image where the line and the car, they are visually similar to not just one image, but like to multiple images in different concept spaces, right? That's why the probability distribution is like sort of split between the two concepts. So this is the, you know, sort of the high level idea. So how do we do this? So we, there's a series of papers, like, you know, uh, the, one of the earliest ones we uh, sort of wrote the, the mathemat mathematics of scaling this up was an AI stats. Uh, and I think there were a few before that as well. But the idea is this, uh, there are two steps to the process. One is you take, uh, you know, sort of start from your data and then you construct, model the graph, basically. That's a process of converting your data, whatever source of data you have into a graph. And then the second process is how do you do learning on top of this graph or inference on top of this graph. Uh, and the beauty of this is that it scales from a computational complexity perspective to billions of nodes, trillions of edges. This is like, you know, we're talking about Google scale, billions of label types. But even if you take your laptop, you would be able to do some ridiculously large amounts of uh, or more complex tasks than we are typically used to. Uh, and that's because of how we sort of bound the computational complexity. So um, just to, before I get into the details of the methods, um, the data, as I mentioned, can be heterogeneous, can be text, images, speech snippets, videos, entities, you know, products, or it could be a combination of that. You could have like image nodes connected to text nodes or speech nodes connected to uh, language nodes. So it can be a heterogeneous graph, right? And quite often it's not one type of data, it's multiple types of data. Um, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about this. Generating the graph itself can be a complex problem. Uh, so if you want to construct a graph where you're trying to compute the similarity between any two type of nodes, um, the standard, the brute force way to do this is uh, quadratic. That means you have n squared complexity. You compare every node with every other node in the graph, right? But turns out you don't need to do this. There are very fast and cheap mechanisms to do this in a linear fashion and in an approximate fashion so that you take some representation of the nodes and then you project it to some um, low dimensional spaces and you can uh, then compute approximate similarity very fast. So if you're interested, please check out the paper that talks a little bit about that. Um, and the edges, they can capture either the inferred similarity, that means uh, similarity is usually defined in some metric space. That means you're computing a distance between two nodes, right? And depending on uh, the representations, right? It can also be natural. That means there's a link membership between the two nodes um, and that would be explicit. Here's a fun example. And this is not a toy example. This is actually a real example where we use, and we actually, uh, there are a bunch of messaging products that actually uh, use, uh, you know, uh, the systems built on top of this. Uh, imagine you're in the conversational setting and uh, you want to learn uh, an emotion graph. That means you want to learn about different types of emotions and how they manifest in like conversations. So we can start from all the way from the left where we say, we have some embedding space, uh, again, glove, but where you can go all the way back or you could take Bert or any of the transform models. Uh, you have a representation of a word or each word that you've observed in a continuous space, dense continuous space. Then you can convert this into a word similarity graph where you're now trying to compute the similarity or distance between these based on the representations. That gives you this graph in the middle uh, because Obviously you might be uh, getting like distance of or similarity of non-zero, but very, very low scores. But the point is to try to construct a sparse graph. You don't want like where every, you don't want a dense graph, which is, or a complete graph where every node is connected to every other node, right? Because uh, um, that's actually A, you wasteful computation when you have to finally do the inference on the graph. B, uh, many of the really low weighted graphs or right? edges, like for example, 0. 0.0001, et cetera, are useless, right? So uh, the middle graph that you see is basically a sparse graph construction uh, based out of the original representations. And now once you have this, 
all you got to do is like a few examples in the graph, you need to label them uh, with the concept. Like for example, if you say the word um, laugh is representing, you know, a funny concept, right? And even though I have never ever seen, or I have no idea what ROTFL means, and which I'm sure many people will agree with uh, a lot of the new acronyms. I mean, you'd no, never know unless you have the right context, right? You would still be able to learn the association of this ROTFL with the funny concept, right? Um, so I think this is the key, like we're now doing things in a very sample efficient manner. We're using the structure of the graph to propagate the information from the output space, the label space into, you know, neighboring nodes and learning a distribution over them. Do you mind if I ask a That's question? A question Go for it. Um, so in terms of generating the sparse graph from the uh, vector space, how do you, like, do you define a threshold and then just say that uh, anything above this, we connect based on like the distance between the two points. Um, and then like second question is like earlier before that you said, uh, we could also like project from the graph into like a lower dimensional vector space. Um, what kind of algorithms would you use for, for that? Yeah, so the approximate similarity computation, I think there are a number of things you could do where, uh, you know, A, if you have some domain knowledge, and let me start from the simplest of the, if you have some domain knowledge, like, for example, you're getting one set of nodes from one uh, source, right, another set of nodes from a different source, and you have some domain knowledge that, hey, these two are orthogonal spaces, right? I mean, so to speak, from a semantic sense of things, you don't necessarily want to even compute, you know, there's a the cross uh, edges, right? Or maybe you want to do the only for a few, but the like the more efficient way, regardless of the domain knowledge uh, or mathematical way to do it is you can look, use things like um, locality sensitive hashing or more uh, advanced versions of that where you're now uh, taking the embedding representations, even if it's a high dimensional representation or uh, you know even if it is 128 dimensional or maybe even it's a billion dimensional vector uh, and project them into uh, sort of quantized and you know, very low dimensional spaces, buckets, so to speak. And then essentially that gives you a mechanism for like, hey, now I need to really look at the nodes within the same bucket or same partition space to actually compute the real similarity because I'm, I have a mathematical and theoretical guarantee that anything between buckets is bounded, the distance is at least bounded by some constant, right? So uh, some factor. So essentially that gives you a way to say that cheaply, oh, I make a linear pass over all the nodes in the graph and I get these uh, sort of like partitions. Um, um, the other thing is you can do things like KN and clustering, right? You can cluster the nodes ahead of time. Um, you can, and you can, there's a number of KNN, KNN++, I mean, or, you know, hierarchic clustering, all sorts of methods, which sort of give you groupings of these like nodes. And then what you need to do is, oh, you only need to sample some nodes within each cluster to compute their, you know, sort of similarity with their, uh, the uh, partition, a different, completely different partition. Or you can say, I compute the centroid of the cluster, right? I mean, I compute, and then I define one edge between the centroids of two groups, right? Um, the part that you mentioned about threshold, yes, I think this is a sort of a practical mechanism where you say that thresholds are too high. I mean, like anything below a certain point is you can actually discard. And usually uh, you don't want to fix, you can start from a fixed threshold, but you want to sort of, um, like start varying that as you get more and more data and like sort of learn that value. Same thing, there are more advanced methods. Um, we've also um, sort of had some methods where we, um, where we learn the graph structure uh, from the representation. So in a way, basically, uh, and I'll give you some examples more towards the end. The, the application may not be necessarily only in um, NLP. It's also for, you know, uh, problems like how do you do uh, min cut partitions in like sort of, uh, this is more in the algorithmic theory world where you say that uh, uh, one of the longstanding problems is like, you know, graph partitioning, right? And uh, the like downstream industry application involved, if you want to place chips uh, on a board, motherboard, right? I mean, uh, and you want to find the ideal placement such that you're gonna sort of like partition the sets of transistors on one, you know, part of the chip versus the other part of the chip. So as to maximize some uh, reward function where you have like, you know, heat and density, et cetera. Uh, there are ways to do that. So I think anywhere from simple thresholding to learning the graph structure using another sort of either neural deep learning models or you know even simple statistical models can be applied. But the key thing is this should not be a bottleneck. If your goal is to scale up, you're, I mean, then you want to do this uh, very efficiently and 
as close to real time or in linear time as possible, right? So because the real complexity comes in actually the learning part, which is going to come up, uh, which uh, I'm going to talk about in this slide. Yeah. Okay. That makes a lot more sense. I, I think the theoretical kind of computer science applications are also kind of interesting, but yeah, thank you. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I think I'll have probably a little bit of time at the end to, you know, talk a little bit more about that. Um, but now that, uh, imagine just like I'll speed it up, uh, in the interest of time. So imagine you have the graph that we have constructed, right. And usually, as I said, it's, it's not a single graph. It's a multi-graph that you're combining from different sources. Um, the, we like for doing inference and I won't go into detail, please check out the paper. Um, the key is like how to do this very efficiently at scale. Right. And we had a, we proposed a distributed graph crossing framework, um, that scales with the number of compute nodes, but it also handles like, you know, billions of nodes and trillions of edges. The key thing is it's not just about distributing the computation across different machines. It's also about what kind of inference you do per node. So basically almost all the objective functions like that we care about, right? I mean, from classification to, as I said, like more complex sequence labeling probs, problems, uh, we can come up with uh, an objective function that is defined on uh, top of this uh, graph. That means at the per node level. And when you compute the gradients, so if you're familiar with the deep learning uh, sense of things, uh, inference and the tra uh, like during every training step involves me as a node looking at my current label distribution or like output distribution, looking at all my neighbors, aggregating that information, synthesizing it, and then making some update step, right? So it's basically, you know, aggregate the information from your neighbors, you know, sort of do some like uh, sort of uh, processing or function uh, transform on top of that and then making an update. So what we propose is a streaming approximation algorithm. So that reduces the complexity instead of looking at all the labels from all your neighbors, right? You can actually do this in constant time, but still with bounded, uh, you know, accuracy. That means you're still guaranteed that you're fully a factor or additive factor away from the true distribution that you want to estimate. Um, and this process, the inference step, you know, sort of think of it as, uh, you know, analogous to the message passing or in the neural world, right? You're uh, updating your parameter servers, like, you know, for every, uh, in every epoch or so, right? Uh, think of the, those are the analogies you can uh, sort of uh, draw uh, here. Uh, essentially, but you run the training for a few iterations and then your label distribution sort of uh, converge to some sort of a local minima. Uh, almost all the objective functions are non-convex, so that's why I said local minima, because if it is convex, then you already have a guarantee that the, the inference is going to converge to the true solution. Um, the translation of what I just said uh, to practical use means you can now make a billion wave prediction problem. You can actually handle, let's say, categorizing across billions of labels and moving from 10 way classification to 100 way to 1000 way to million way to billion way basically incurs you the same amount of compute. So that's super important, right? Because if you have very complex tasks, you don't want to like spend a lot more compute uh, you know, on sort of scaling up in the output space, right? And the key is, not every node is going to be associated with all of those billion labels. I, uh, so just can I ask a question? Sure. Yeah. So I'm just trying to kind of uh, like situate this conceptually. So, so it seems that the machine learning framework is itself aware of the graph, right? It doesn't seem, or, 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 or is it, or, or is the graph pre-processing done before you get to the part that's doing the machine learning? So the graph construction is done before you do the learning, but you know there is a correlation. I think there's an interesting point you make on how you distribute what parts of the graph to which machine can affect your communication complexity. Because when you're doing the gradient updates, right? For example, if most of the nodes within the, the substructure that you have are on the same machine, right? I mean, it's just a memory lookup, you can look up your neighbors. But in, on the other hand, if it's actually like, you know, uh, you know, on a completely different machine, right? You need to actually now make a call and actually draw which of the neighbors and what's the current distribution, right? And there are different mechanisms, push basis, pull based mechanisms, you know, like uh, through the literature that have been exposed. Like, um, so originally we actually, uh, developed things on top of like Pregel, but then, uh, which is like, you know, one of the industry, um, you know, we had also open sourced it, but then that 
led to problems like you have like high degree nodes, which actually hog up all the computation, right? When you're doing the learning, um, then there were approximate methods. So there are like a sequence of updates. I think now the trillions of edges, the, the, mention, the ones that I mentioned are the, uh, the graph partitioning and how to do that very efficiently across different machines are like, you know, sort of built on custom, like, you know, large scale infrastructure, but the principles are the same. Uh, you want to essentially try to make sure that um, whatever neighborhood that you think are going to be closely representing the uh, the changes in the label distributions or the gradient updates, you want to sort of keep that like local, right? And so you want to minimize the amount of global communication. Um, and the analogy here is also for deep networks, right? When you are when you have like say a million examples uh, and let's say billion parameters, not all the parameters are going to be sort of updated all at once, right? I mean, so you really want to make sure that the ones that are most relevant, so the data parallelism versus the model parallelism. I'm just curious, would it have been possible to have treated, uh, like, like one idea was just, you know, first came to mind when you, you know, proposed that this is a graph problem, was that, could you have, let's say, pre-processed the graph in a, and let's say propagated the label to all of the instances so that by the time you get to the machine learning part, from the point of a learner, it just sees like a flat, you know, list of, of training examples where the graph part is actually done ahead of time where you've in, in, in kind of propagating the labels among the neighbors with the right weights somehow. Like, is that, is that, is that a valid approach or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So one approach? of the, uh, I think uh, the, the, the framework itself is a generalizable. One of the learning mechanisms itself is like a uh, propagation, like Billy propagation kind of style where you're actually just sending messages, right? I mean, from your node yeah. to the neighboring nodes. And the update is big, the gradient update in that setting is like, you know, sort of uh, looking, you know, sort of summing up all the label distributions and then averaging and like weighting it by the, you know, the proportional of the, you know, the edge weight. And then like, do, that's basically the, you can derive that becomes the update, right? Uh, but there are more complex ones um, and that works. I think it's uh, useful, especially because most of the updates are sparse. Like, I mean, you don't need to do like, you know, a, a pass over every node. Like for example, if there are disconnected parts of the graph, they never going to communicate with every other part of the graph, right? Um, but the more complex versions and or the more uh, advanced versions of this are where you're trying to learn, we had, uh, you know, we have problems where we are trying to learn that Sort of a predictive function on the node and about the structure around the node at the same time as like you're trying to learn something about the label distribution right so there what you can do is you can start from a smaller graph so to speak to do the estimates right i mean to do this like you know propagation style thing and then use that to sort of translate it into the neural uh, part of the graph i'll talk about the neural structure learning and how we, we broke that problem down uh, okay. Come in a few slides, hopefully. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Um, so, uh, well, not two slides, one slide. Sorry. <laughs> I think uh, so. The so the we so like you know we were uh, working a bunch of these problems at scale where we're talking about like how do you compute over structures you know and um, quite often this was around like you know the time then we announced externally you know at Google that hey we had. Uh, surpassed the human level performance, the inception networks came out, right? So one of the challenges like, you know, how do we leverage this, like the semi supervised graph uh, framework uh, at scale, but also where the ML model is actually a neural model, right? I mean, it's non-trivial um, to do that. And so this area is what we refer to as neural structured learning and the framework. Um, and the neural part means that the learning itself uses deep learning, right? Deep networks um, and the, key is like, how do you combine the graph structure with the deep networks? So um, as you can imagine, there are many ways to do this. Um, take the graph, you know, learn something uh, on top of the graph, sufficient statistics, and then just pass it on as representations into the network or right? features into the network, right? Uh, you can go the other way as well, like where you say, hey, take a network, learn some representation over a bunch of examples and treat them as nodes and now construct a graph and do like, you know, sparse update on the graph. Um, uh, but the key is how do you do this jointly, right? I mean, how do you do this efficiently in a, in a very uh, like a scalable fashion scale in terms of not data, but also that it can actually solve different types of problems. Mm -hmm. And before I tell you how, uh, these are actually some of the real world applications of neural structured learning, right? I mean, in Google. Um, 
I guess some, at least a lot of you might have heard of Smart Reply, and this is the one uh, something that we invented. Um, and now I think there are like uh, you know seven, I think like 101 variations of this, almost like an autocomplete like feature. Um, this is if you're using Gmail on your mobile phone, um, you see these suggestions pop up right when you receive an email, right? Uh, and this uh, also uh, is enabled in uh, several chat applications. Sure. So. This is one of the first ones uh, where we actually did this at scale. Um, fun fact, I mean, almost 11% of the replies um, on mobile were actually generated by Smart Reply. And I will go into a little bit more detail about this. For people who think this is a simple RNN or a transformer style sequence to sequence problem, to get it working, it's not. You have to solve a ton of stuff. This is where the um, graph structure helps quite a bit. The difference between getting an accuracy on some held out data set versus it being useful, right? Uh, there are a thousand ways to say thanks. And there are three, like, you know, you can draw three suggestions from millions of possible responses. How does it, uh, you know, work for you? How do you combine? How do you incorporate diversity in the responses? How do you make sure that it is like, they're contextually relevant? There's a, like several things that go along with it. How do you not say anything sensitive? Like, for example, like somebody says, hey, uh, somebody passed away, you don't want to say congratulations. And these generative models can do these sort of things, um, you know, offhand, right? So you want to prevent all that stuff. Um, two more, uh, you know, sort of classic problems are email classification. So these papers I mentioned it to image recognition and video rec uh, summarization and even multimodal learning where you're combining contextual information from a conversation through visual signals and also the language signals. Um, the papers, you can find them on my website. Uh, I would encourage you to take a look at uh, each of these if you're interested in these specific ones. Um, but here's one of the examples. And I said the goal is for neural structure learning to combine graph structure and uh, neural computing, basically deep networks, right? And one of the most common forms of deep networks in NLP is sequence models. At the time, this is like, you know, uh, four, five, I think something six years ago or something like that, uh, RNNs were the ones. So you can replace this with transformers and this, the same principles apply. The idea is like, we broke down the generation problem here, this multiply problem into two parts. The graph part, the graph learning part basically tries to learn a structure, a structured partition space of all possible responses that you can sort of convey for any incoming message, right? Uh, and the reason to do this is uh, we're not trying to, if you just freely let it generate, right, you can say arbitrary things, right, especially without enough context. Um, so we're trying to learn a structured response space that actually captures semantics, but is also interpretable. So every node in this graph, you can actually say, oh, this means like something related to time, time of day, or say you're asking about a specific concept. And the neural part of it is basically given the structured response space that the graph learns and, and is also represented in the graphical format, maps any incoming input conversation uh, and you know sort of picks the most relevant response and like reasons over the structure and picks the most relevant response from that. So why is that needed? So just to give you a sample, uh, if you somebody says, hey, can you join tomorrow's meeting, right? I mean, there are many possible valid responses. Sure, I'll be there. Yes, I can. Yes, I can be there. I mean, there are many ways to say this, right? Um, what we wanted to do is it's not just give you like a laundry list of all possible things, right? It, you also want to make sure that you're giving the most useful information. So if I said one or gave you one suggestion that says, yes, I can, sure. Then I also want to show you an alternate possibility, right? Sorry, I won't be able to make it. So like, yes, no, maybe, right? I mean, so I don't want to give you like three different variations of Thanks, THX, THX dot, 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 THX exclamation, 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 right? So this is what the graph structure and the interpretability of that like yields, right? So the diversity in responses and also the relevance. Um, the, uh, in the interest of time, I can, if you have more questions, I mean, I can cover it, uh, if, a quick question or so, or if not, I can move on. Okay. So um, the same principles, as I said, apply to if you want to combine graphs with, you know, for the image world, visual tasks, right? I mean, here the network just changes the, you know, instead of uh, encoder decoder model, uh, RNN model, you now have a convolution, deep convolution net. And that operates on top of an image similarity graph. And you can see an example of this image similarity graph, right? And here, 
uh, two images that look like pumpkins, right, or not, right? I mean, one is one represents the pumpkin as a sort of the fruit versus the other one is like a pumpkin pie and more like dessert kind of items, right? Um, and so you can, so in like, whether it's language, visual, speech, or any other modality, you can actually now start thinking about this like really interesting way of structuring your space, uh, whether that's learned or implicit, and then trying to use powerful models like neural networks to sort of reason on top of the space. The key challenge though is, right, you can do this in an ad hoc fashion. Right? You do first some graph learning and then you sort of combine it with some uh, neural network inference um, or you can do the vice versa, right? But they're not as powerful and efficient, right? So the ideal thing would be to do this in a joint fashion. How do you sort of do the graph and the neural network inference at the same time? So in other words, that's what we call, so it's not one instance of the neural structured learning that we uh, propose is called neural graph machine. And the way it's motivated by how we were doing the updates earlier, um, the distributed fashion that I showed you. And the key is we define a joint framework that allows you to train deep networks using graphs. Note that this is, if you have ever heard of graph neural networks, this was a precursor to all of that. And I'll tell you why some of the graph neural network approaches work well, even though there are 1001 papers today, an archive on that. Um, some of them work really well, some of them don't. Um, so what we did is like, we want our objective was also to do this, uh, you know, at scale, but without like just throwing too much computer on it. And um, a simple elegant formulation of that is like, you can break down the objective function that you want to optimize into two parts. And the first part is um, you're trying to like map, it's your standard neural network type objective function where you're taking an input and you're defining some sort of mapping through multiple layers of the deep network convolution stacks or you know transformers or whatever operations you have to learn the right predictive function right so you're mapping some x's into y's right and through making a forward pass through the network the second part of it is going to incorporate the graph structure in other words you're defining uh, an objective function that says if i'm an example or a node in the graph I want to be as close as possible, um, or I have a, like I said, WIJs represent the edge weight. If two nodes are connected strongly, that means I have a high WIJ weight, then the representation that I'm learning at every level of the network, right, should be as close as possible. That means, in other words, if I'm very strongly connected, then I should capture the same semantics in my network, in my neural network. And this is what it defines here, right? So, and the, this is the alternate part of the objective function. And there are a number of ways to do this. Like the, you can define edges between labeled and unlabeled nodes, labeled and labeled nodes. They capture different type of properties. Um, but through this whole process, you can, the nice part about this is you can learn this end to end using uh, back propagation. So it is differentiable. So you can use stochastic gradient descent and you can, it scales linearly in the number of edges. Edges can be decomposed, as I said, based on the type of property. Check out this, uh, I think there were a few different papers. This is one of the original papers for more details on this. Um, the beauty of this is it doesn't matter what your network structure is. You can apply this with feed forward. You can apply this with convolution. You can apply this with like RNNs. You can apply this with transformers, right? The network structure itself does not necessarily matter. Um, how you define that objective function and what part of the network will matter. If you define it more on the, let's say, all the way at the last output layer, that's just saying that, hey, force the network to learn that two neighbors that are strongly connected should get the same label. If you do that further down at the input layer, that just means learn a representation such that, hey, if I'm connected to node X uh, in the graph very strongly, then my input feature space, the representation space, the embedding space should look very similar, right? In terms of distance metric. That's what it's question. Yeah. In that training, will it change what nodes are connected? Yes. So the sound, let me see if that is here. Yeah, uh, it, it does change because now when you're doing a batch, like when you're uh, actually uh, constructing your batches for doing the training, your network training, you're not, uh, uh, sampling just random nodes or sorry, random examples in your training data. You're actually now going to be sampling edges, nodes and their neighbors, part of the neighbors. 
there's a nice way to do this very efficiently and like you know keeping it bounded like you really you sample a fixed number of random edges per node etc so your batch size is now going to be uh like pairs of edges as opposed to just examples and their feature representations does that make sense that that that's how you uh like choose which samples to train over that can be so the sample uh, can be random just like any other neural network training because like i mean you can be very careful about which uh let's say the if you have a really small batch size you know you can either do it randomly or you can be careful about which training examples you pull in but um, that applies here as well uh, usually but the more important part is like when you're sampling let's say i sample five uh, random examples from my training set whenever i'm putting that in the batch at the same time I'll, I'll also add the neighbors of those five examples and the representation and the features or the input like features so to speak in the same batch because i need that information right there's a way to avoid that and say that oh i'll just compute the left part of this equation the gradient with respect to the left part of this equation and then for the right part I'll go and do a lookup during the training, but that's more costly because it's not very uh, efficient if you look at the computing. Because that means you'll have to make an RPC call and go out of your machine, etc. So usually, it's best to do this in the batch stage, batch construction stage. And will that? I well, I'm not sure I understand the the loss function for the the graph part port uh, portion of it. Will that change the weights, or that actually change like what nodes are connected? Active. No, the losses, the weights are predetermined uh, on the at least the you know the one that I showed you. Uh, the WIJs are basically the graph is constructed and somebody gives you that, or you know you construct it in some form like we discussed earlier. Um, now, when you're computing the gradients for an example, right? You're not just computing whether just let's say backprop through the last layer and go down and you're saying, hey, compute with respect to the error you computed for that, uh, the predicted Y label versus the true Y label, right? That's the first part of the equation. You're also going to compute for my current representation, like, and my neighbors, right? How far away am I, right? With my, with respect to my neighbors, right? That part that's added to the loss function. So, and to do that, you need to have access to your neighbor's representation based on the current network predictions. Does it make sense? So you make the forward pass for yourself and also for your neighbors, and then you use the, the output label to compute the gradients for the left part of the equation, and then you use your neighbor's representation to compute the gradients for your the graph part of the objective function. So it doesn't change the graph, but it changes how the graph is interpreted? Yes, it changes how uh, the network weights, what network weights you're gonna learn. It doesn't change the graph itself. It just changes like what weights you're learning in every iteration. Oh, cool. Thank you. Cool. Um, okay, so uh, I think I gave a quick overview. Of, so the application, the nice part about this is like if you don't rely and heavily on the specific type of network structure, um, you can just swap this out with anything else and you know you can apply it to you know all the way from you know social graph prediction problems like categorizing users to text classification to conversational understanding you know predicting you know what is the intent for a given conversational utterance uh, and the other advantage i feel like this is one of the i think like the sort of core nuggets that we found was if you start looking at this new structure learning and the NGMs um, for standard problems, the byproduct of that was that you can actually learn really good models with far fewer data. And also your network size itself can actually reduce. So instead of, let's say, just to give you an example for an image class uh, task, instead of taking a nine layer or 12 layer network, you can replace that with a six layer network now, under normal learning theory assumptions, right, you're reducing the number of parameters, so you don't have enough capacity. But you're going to augment uh, and like sort of uh, make up for that gap by adding the graph structure, like what, during the training process, and you might actually get the same, if not better, accuracy. So this yields like smaller, faster networks, and also like with higher prediction quality. So you're trying to leverage structure in very interesting ways. So that was the other. So if you're uh, you know like uh, interested in like how can I change the computation, right, for my network, right? I mean, there are different ways to do it. 
you know, all the way from trying to optimize a network structure to, you know, quantization to doing on the, there's a whole line of work on that, uh, which I described earlier. Uh, but the other way is like, how can you leverage structure in your data? Uh, you know, that can sort of uh, augment and also remove the dependency on the like scale in terms of supervision. Okay. Um, and if you were ever wondering like, hey, how do I ever do this, right? I mean, so we actually released this in TensorFlow, I think a few years back. Uh, it's available in open source neural structured learning. You can go download it, try it out um, for a variety of problems from language to bioinformatics that are people doing this for a whole bunch of applications. Um, okay, so quick note, uh, I, th I, I think I gave you an idea of like, you know, how the neural structure learning framework works, um, you know, besides the language problems, I think image recognition is one of the interesting ones is a paper last year that we published and that takes it to a very different scale and allows you to learn um, output, like basically image recognition models where you can now scale from, you know, your standard thousands of categories on ImageNet to actually millions of categories, but at the same quality levels, right? And the, as I said, like the way we can do that is because we can learn really robust representations that, you know, leverage the graph structure and so it becomes very sample efficient. That means you don't need a lot of data per label to actually uh, train the neural network. So this is, um, this is called graph rise. Um, we also applied this to very different type of, uh, you know, graph, neural graph, uh, neural graph learning or neural structured learning uh, for more traditional problems. Um, so graph partitioning is an age old problem, right? I mean, the algorithm theory community has been working on this for a long time. So, um, the, there's an iClear 2019 paper, and then I think there are subsequent papers as well, uh, where we show uh, what we call GAP, generalizable approximate graph partitioning, where you're trying to learn a you know, graph, neural graph model that actually uh, does the same in principle, uh, what a traditional graph partitioning objective looks like. So essentially, um, you're trying to come up with like if if people who are familiar with this, right, HMIT is in their standard tools that almost every VLSI company in the Ali or in, you know, in the industry uses for chip placement. Uh, what we can do, is, and the nice part about them are they're super fast, right? These are a bunch of heuristics and sometimes approximate algorithms developed over several decades. Nice part about the gap style method is that um, you can actually learn on more data and you can learn on different types of graph they generalize to new types of graphs very nicely. So you can actually get very competitive performance without you know, like uh, being too slow, right? Because one of the like downsides of like deep networks or at least uh, challenges are like, how do you make them run fast, as fast as like traditional approximate algorithms, right? Um, so if you're interested, take a look. So uh, I think this is a very interesting one because uh, it's not just about we've been in this uh, space for a long time. It's not just about like, you know, how do you use graph uh, theory and how do you combine that with neural networks or machine learning? I think we can go the other way as well. We can actually influence traditional graph theoretic methods and like, you know, that space and that line of research um, and come up with new breakthroughs, right? So uh, I, this is pretty exciting. Um, and this is one of the most fundamental problems, right? I mean, the theory world that involves graphs partitioning. So if we can actually make uh, breakthroughs in terms of powerful models that are like generalizable and actually can give us new results, even like small additive factors make a huge difference when you're talking about like chip placement, something like chip placement, right? Because the number of transistors are like just, you know, the order of millions. Um, finally, maybe I'll, uh, I think I have some more time, right? So I'll, because we are taking questions in the, mid, in the middle. So I think hopefully we have, how much time do we have left? Yeah, you have time. Uh, I mean, the slot isn't until like 4.10 or 4.15. Okay. But I would recommend maybe finishing up around four just to allow some time for oh, okay. discussion. Perfect. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so, uh, I think besides, we'll like say you. Uh, hopefully, this gives you an idea of like what the notion of or how powerful neural structured learning type of uh, you know frameworks can be. Um, 
what I didn't mention uh, in the previous slide was uh, there's a very nice generalization to uh, adversarial methods. If you look at uh, the way I defined the objective function earlier, like, uh, you know, adversarial methods, scans, and all these sort of things are very popular these days, right? I mean, uh, you can actually use and formulate adversarial learning in the neural structure learning framework. And there, the difference is that instead of thinking about a real true neighbor, uh, what you would be doing is you'd be simulating an adversary uh, in the training process, like, and there'll be a link connected between you and the adversary in the training process. Um, that's just at the high level, but the, you know, the, you can go to the website and like there's like detailed write-ups and papers associated with this. Um, okay, so hopefully that gives you a picture of like neural structure learning, what it's useful for. Next, uh, maybe in the next several minutes, I'll give you sort of a little bit of a sneak peek into deep dive into the work, research work we have been doing on using neural structure learning for um, more knowledge intensive tasks. So, you know, I think one of the most natural places where our type of task where neural graph computing is useful is like, uh, you know, knowledge graph tasks. So everybody knows knowledge graphs are like, you know, sort of one of the core parts of like all the major search engines and also even conversational AI systems because like um, applications ranging from like, you know, looking and learning entity relationships to predicting facts, you know, from in databases to question answering more recently, which is actually now again searched um, to doing reasoning uh, at multiple levels, right? So in fact, imagine if you have given a portion of a knowledge graph um, where the answer is not immediately uh, available in the direct neighborhood, right? You have to actually make two or three or four hops. Sometimes even it's not even at the fifth hop, right? And how do you reason and how do you do this to actually come up with the right answer? Um, in the traditional, like, you know, for example, Amazon and even Google, et cetera, uh, you also want to understand like, hey, if I show you a product or maybe even a web page, right? What are the attributes associated or an entity? What are the attributes associated with that, right? Because that might be used uh, or useful to make some predictions about the ranking or the placement or like, you know, what results you're gonna see next, et cetera, right? So whole bunch of applications are on knowledge graphs. And as you can see, knowledge graph has graph at the end of it. So there's a natural structure. You don't have to go and build anything to compute the graph, right? Here, the graph is like sort of available in real world knowledge, right? So this is the advantage here. Um, so I'll talk about two, uh, actually three different works. First set of works, like the first one from, uh, I think it's still 2019 and the other one appeared, I think last year. Uh, but these were done a few years ago, um, are a novel class of graph attention mechanisms that sort of uh, addresses some of the challenges I mentioned. So the first one is like, uh, let's take a problem of, uh, you know, uh, link prediction or missing fact prediction, right? So if I give you like Oprah Winfrey, a source node, and then I say relation nationality, and I give you the subgraph, right? Uh, what is the answer, right? And the challenge is that, if it's you know in the knowledge graph as a direct link, that means here like the edges are representing links between different entities. So you know Oprah Winfrey is in green because it's a source node, and like the other ones are the neighbors, and the blue ones on the uh, the annotations on the edges are basically the relation types or the relationship names. So the challenge is that I mean if it was already you know um, uh, it was already a fact on already present in your database or knowledge graph, you can just do a lookup. But quite often it's not, right? You have to actually reason. Oprah Winfrey lived in Tennessee, Tennessee, uh, you know, and she was maybe like in the early part of her life. And then Tennessee is, you know, stayed in the US or, you know, placed in the US. And then, you know, as a result, I can now impute that, oh, she's a US citizen, American citizen, right? So that's the challenge, right? I mean, uh, this is a very, very simple example, right? So uh, the paper is from ACL, uh, you can check uh, A2N. Um, what we came up with is, uh, you know, the more recent approaches, like before this work, um, all looked at uh, the following class of methods um, in the neural sense of things, right? There are traditional methods that actually did this using probabilistic graphical models, but most of the common neural network approaches takes the entity, takes an embedding representation of the entity, takes the relation, takes the emb embedding representation of the relation, combines it in some way, and then looks at 
all possible target nodes and compute based on the representations and compute what which one is the most uh, similar one or closest and then say hey that's my most likely answer so what we propose is instead of doing that it's much better to actually look at query dependent and dynamically computed contextual representations that means the representation of oprah winfrey given the nationality relation and which neighbors are appearing is going to change so there's no single entity representation that you will look up for Oprah Winfrey. I mean, you might have a starting representation, but in fact, for every query or every uh, sort of uh, task that you get, you're going to now dynamically compute based on the neighborhood and the relation and additional information that you have. And so your embedding representation, both for you and the neighbors change. And you're going to use this dynamically computed embedding representation to come up with the right answer. Um, the paper, uh, you know, has more details, but like what that allows you to do is it gives you at the time state of the -art results for KG reasoning tasks, uh, but also gives you some really nice answers to, you know, like the simple example I told you, Oprah Winfrey nationality, right? Uh, you can now look at the probability that it assigns to the different relationships. And this is because of the attention mechanism. So the attention weights are actually now learning, depending on the dynamically changing context, it actually learns the right distribution. So if you look at the left, um, you know, places lived in gets a higher probability than the profession relation, right? For this particular query. Now, if you had changed the query to something else, you know, the same relation would get a different value for the probability. And Oprah Winfrey award nomination, right? I mean, so the award nomination relationship, right, gets you gets a higher probability or attention weight in the network compared to any of the other relations in the neighborhood. Um, and on a bunch of benchmark data sets, this actually outperformed the you know the existing state of the art at the time. Uh, I think it's also interesting to look at the top neighbors in terms of relations, like for a given query for bill pay and profession. Uh, you can see the top neighbors, even though it's not the exact musician, like you can see recording contribution, right? Instrumentalist. These are all in the same concept space as musician, right? So that's what gets surfaced and like sort of gets attended to more than um, uh, possibly other types of entities. And same thing for the bottom example. So this was, um, was basically uh, nice. And I think like a core uh, sort of the, uh, I think the idea here being that the context changes dynamically and based on the query, right? So um, I think the fun big uh, leap that we made in NLP, uh, you know, compared to all the bird style models, is that instead of like computing fixed representations, look at the con context, right, and actually predict them using masking or whatever mechanism, right? Here, there's a similar kind of effect here where we're saying the context, the neighborhood, and the relationship, the weights on them, how we attend to changes based on the query, right? So um, and that's how and use that to compute the representation, which is again dynamically generated, and then use that to rank the possible uh, answers to this. Um, uh, so, so just a, a quick question, and uh, so this this knowledge graph approach is really interesting. Uh, but does this presume that the that the knowledge graph itself has a set of statically computed embeddings that you can kind of use at inference or? No, there's no okay. assumption. I mean, okay. if you have it, you can use it to initialize the entities with those embeddings, uh, but it could come from just as well something that you uh, sort of uh, infer or learn over unstructured data um, as a starting point, right? So, um, but there's an assumption that the links, the neighborhood, right? The links, the neighbors are coming from the knowledge graph, right? Again, right. that's a, not a hard assumption, but for knowledge graph tasks, that's the, the input is like some part of the knowledge graph, right? I mean, we could argue that those relationships also could be imputed right. from structure, right. structure, right. unstructured text, yeah. Okay, but, but the embeddings then, you're saying they're kind of, you know, learned as part of the training process in the same way that for these contextualized word embeddings, all of the you know, embeddings are learned in context Yes, uh, okay. the entities for initialization, uh, you could actually we you know, we, I think, I believe we ran different sets of experiments, but uh, for initialization, you could actually, if uh, a specific phrase or entity already has embeddings in some, let's say, glove or whatever representation, mm -hmm. you can use that to initialize, but those are changed. Okay. Uh, but you might as well start from, let's say, randomly initialized ones, right? Mm -hmm. uh, which obviously will get you to a different point, but there is no hard assumption that the you need the knowledge graph embeddings. Okay. Okay, good, thanks.
Um, the second set of work here is again on KGs, but it, it attacks a different problem. Um, and this is like almost all knowledge graphs, right? I mean, like the, the ones that we use on a daily basis or, you know, that you're using indirectly through search engines or other mechanisms on a daily basis, right? Ex exhibit different kinds of patterns and relationships. Um, and what we found is that neural graph computing could be actually very useful to learn different, not just these linear type of relationships, but also hierarchical and logical patterns. And just to give you an example, if you look at the left, right? I mean, uh, Steven Spielberg, director of Jurassic Park, I mean, you can see there's a hierarchical relationship, right? Between this, this different sets of nodes. It's not just simple, like undirected graphs where every node and every edge that are, are like at the same level, right? And why it matters, if you look at the right, if you just use standard embedding type approaches, uh, take the example on the right, like Barack Obama, you know, Michelle Obama, Malia and Sasha, right? Um, I have the relation married and father and father. If I embed this, I'm not now able to see, wait, hey, between Malia and um, Michelle Obama, right? Is it the mother relationship? They're not symmetric, right? These relationships are not symmetric. So how do you learn such logical patterns or relationships between different type of nodes, right? Um, especially using the continuous space models like embeddings. So this is a problem we are trying to adjust. And our answer to this is, uh, I think it's like very interesting work. I feel, uh, I think it, we already see there are a bunch of people who are both on top of what we proposed last year. And I think it's uh, taking off. And the premise, uh, the core piece of the solution is uh, use hyperbolic attention mechanisms. So uh, for those of you who don't know, so most embeddings are computed in Euclidean spaces. Hyperbolic spaces, I mean, just in a simple nutshell is a way of representing these hierarchical relationships in low dimensions, right? So what we propose is like this knowledge hyperbolic, um, you know, attention mechanism that combines hyperbolic operations with attention mechanism to learn these complex relationship patterns. And there's a notion of, there's a bunch of uh, involved math in the paper, you can check it out. But the key thing is there are uh, certain sets of parameters associated with the curvature of the relationship that uh, are part of the hyperbolic uh, you know, parameters that we learn, which allows us to generalize to different type of relationships. Right? So um, as a result, you, we can actually improve over the existing KG benchmarks, right? Not for just the standard relations, but like also the asymmetric and logical relationships. Um, just a note, it's not that you can't do this with embeddings, just, a, just a throwing out there. But to capture these complex relationships, you will need much larger embedding spaces. That means instead of 128, you might need thousand dimensional or like, you know, so basically some sort of memorization properly right, in the embedding space. So what hyperbolic allows you to do is do this very efficiently in very low dimensions. So um, just like, again, I won't go into it. On benchmark data sets, you can see that there are no, there's a notion of rotation and um, sort of reflection for hyperbolic uh, operations. And the ones where we learn the attention mechanisms in the hyperbolic space are get much better results. And you can see that at really high dimensions, it probably doesn't matter. The both of them actually perform at the same level, but at the low dimensions, like hyperbolic uh, versions actually outperform the Euclidean space versions. And this is exactly what we're trying to do. You want to like use that space and ma map complex relationship, but using very low dimensions, right? Be very efficient about it. Um, and if you look at the type of relationship on the right, you see a visualization. It kind of learns like a tree-like structure in terms of the, uh, the representations uh, versus like the standard embeddings, the Euclidean embeddings. But if, if you also look at the improvement of the hyperbolic attention mechanism that I said um, we introduced versus the traditional or the Euclidean-based approaches, you see the highest improvement in terms of the gap right, percentage in terms of the error, right? for relations which are non-symmetric, like hypernames, right? These are asymmetric relations, right? This is exactly what we expect. For the ones where we say similar to, which is at the bottom of the table here on the left, um, you don't see any improvement at all. So this is completely understandable, right? Because things like, hey, this is a father of, right? The, uh, you know, or this is a member of, this is a subset of, superset of, these sort of relationships, right? These are not easily capturable with just, uh, you know, standard Euclidean based approaches with fixed dimensions, right? This is where you can see the hyperbolic actually dominating. So it's an exciting line of work. We feel, I think this is opening up new things uh, in the, both the KG reasoning space and also on applying this to other types of problems.
Uh, just to clarify real quick on the yeah. hyperbolic thing, because it's really interesting. Like, how are you, is the idea that like this, the structure of the hyperbolic space itself allows you to perform like certain operations on the embeddings that have this like two, two directional, like this bi-directional structure, I guess? Yeah, so yeah, exactly. So the, in the hyperbolic space, there's this notion of the curvature, rotations and reflection. So we actually learn parameters associated with that. Um, there's one detail, which I, you can see in the paper, but I'll just mention it, which is important. Um, doing this, right, in, in the math form, right, when you're doing the training is non-trivial. So what we do is we come up with a translation operator, which actually says that for every, you know, gradient update that you do for your neural network, or when you're doing the back propagation, we compute something in the hyperbolic space, then you translate this in the Euclidean space and then do the gradient update. So this makes it very efficient, right? So because just operating in the hyperbolic space alone, um, you know, for uh, like for neural network training, for inference, it might be fast, but for training, doing this many, many times is not so non-trivial, right? So there's, I think the, you'll see in the paper, there are some details about that, but essentially, yeah, I think you got the fundamental, right? right? The, in the hyperbolic space, there's this notion of curvature and like reflection and uh, rotation. We learn certain parameters associated with that, which helps like sort of capture this complex asymmetric relationships. Then we translate them into the Euclidean space to update the parameters, right? And backprop through the convolution network or, you know, transform, it doesn't matter, whatever the network, right? And then like in the next iteration, we do the same thing again and again. So uh, in a sense, like all the parameter updates, right? After that epoch, it's, preserving some property in the hyperbolic space. Cool, that makes sense, thanks. Um, finally, um, so there's also more recent work and you'll see a series of work and uh, on how do you use this neural structure learning or graph structures for uh, problems like summarization and generation. And you'll see a bunch of things coming out from my group. Um, one of them is on long form uh, summarization, long document summarization and one of the key ideas here is like how to use like graph networks or graph uh, computing and like in the sense of how I showed neural structure learning, both to encode structure um, within documents. That means, you know, passages are related to each other or concepts and phrases are related to each other and also across document. Think about like, you know, uh, documents like linked with other documents, right? If you look at Wikipedia and then the web, right? So how do you use intra and inter document sort of structure to capture this information to do things like better question answering or to do better abstractive summarization? Uh, I think this is like also interesting uh, because uh, these type of problems are now starting to, uh, I think uh, Edward should know, summarization is one of those problems which has existed for I think 20 30 40 years and in my I think I've worked on it at least 15 or 20 years ago as well um, it never you know got to the point where it's like hey there's a lot of like you know interesting solution we also had some theoretical work out there um, I think now it's starting to look like abstractive summarization it is getting to the point where it's uh, very interesting it's getting like readable content and uh, you know you're able to generate interesting uh, factually correct etc and all sorts of uh, you know sort of uh, interesting from both from a research perspective and also making it uh, practical right so um we'll see um a lot of uh, interesting applications and you will also you are i think in the last five years you have already seen these things come out in the wild like in the industry uh, in several forms so um, I think, yeah, that's uh, pretty much it. Hopefully uh, this was informative. I'm happy to take more questions if you have them. Wow, thank you for a, a great talk on graph learning. Uh, uh, yeah, so at this point, let's uh, open it up for just a general discussion. Uh, are there any other uh, you know, questions about anything in the talk? Uh, okay, I have a question. Uh, thanks for your presentation. So <clears throat> I think I missed some context, but I have a question like, what's the difference between your like neural structure learning with the comma neural graph and neural graph neural networks? Because for all those tasks, I can use like a, a general graph neural network to solve, right? Yeah, yeah, it's a good point. I think I promised that I will give you some uh, background on this <laughs> during my talk. So the graph, so the all the neural structure learning stuff that I talked about, this came. This was actually a precursor to the uh, 
the GCN, Graph Convolution Network, and the GNNs uh, that you're probably familiar with. Um, so in fact, we actually had a paper even um, you know, on graph attention uh, for image recognition that we felt the results were not that good. We had improvements, one of my interns had improvements, and uh, we're like, ah, it's not that good. And then like uh, next quarter, we see there's a paper by Yoshua and others on graph attention. Right? I think the field is moving fast. One thing though, if you look at the original graph convolution paper, um, the way convolutions are defined, right? I mean, the convolution operation on top of the graph structure, there's a reason why there is no paper and also almost every subsequent implementation, like the, um, why they stop at second order, right? Convolution, because, right? I mean, it's uh, like if, because it's computationally like infeasible, right? I mean, if you want to do it on a really large graph, with like sort of uh, it goes beyond multiple three or four layers, right? So what they've shown is like, oh, we can do graph convolutions, but you know, just do it for you know one level or two levels at most, right? And there have been even some papers that actually show that you don't even need convolutions. If you just take the adjacency matrix of the graph and then just shove it into the, you know, the like without any additional convolution operation, like you know, and do some operation on top of that, or just use it as is. And in fact, they, I think even the paper had a baseline where they just used random edges, right? I mean, instead of even the adjacency matrix, you might get the similar result. Um, I think the what I would say the big advantage that we had is like, and this was basically because we were trying to operate at different scales, is we looked at it from like an optimization uh, standpoint, right? I mean, the objective function, that's why we broke it down. And this was motivated by the earlier works on, you know, large scale sparse updates and label propagation and all that class of methods. And the advantage is that now if you're thinking of just sampling edges, right, and like sort of optimizing these components in the objective function, A, they become differentiable. They're also computationally efficient because now you can actually translate this to semi-supervised learning, unsupervised learning, fully supervised learning. You can actually use the graph structure, like you can actually even bound the neighborhood. You can even learn the structure. There's a new paper that we had where we're trying to learn the structure of the graph simultaneously where we'll actually trying to you know, optimize the label distribution on the output of the network. Um, the, I think the reason why it makes a difference is if you, and we evaluated this, uh, I would say one of the drawbacks of the community, I think we all <laughs> take response, should take responsibility is almost all the initial uh, GCN and the corresponding papers. And um, I think this is a gripe we have for the authors as well. They should have corrected this. They're all done on a data set or sets of data sets, core and other things where you have like hundreds of nodes or thousands of nodes. And the results are grossly misleading because if you just scale up the graph by one order magnitude, then you start seeing the difference between performances between GAT and GCN and like, I mean, actually there might not even be a difference, right? I mean, so this is why I was saying that if you just replace and throw away all the stuff, just use the adjacency matrix, you might just get the same result. So this is why um, we went the route of like, hey, uh, you know, optimize, uh, like think about it from an objective uh, function perspective, make it differentiable, you know, use backprop, but like, you know, sample over the edges instead of restricting it, uh, restricting it to just convolution type of operations, right? I think GCN would fit into this framework as well if you were to define like the objective function slightly differently. And in every uh, update, like you're actually doing, like uh, you're actually looking at the entire neighborhood for all the examples in one shot, right? Instead of randomly sampling, you're looking at the first level or the second level neighborhood all in one shot. Um, but again, I think these methods are, you know, evolving. So we're going to start we're seeing like more and more interesting approaches and forks uh, and what works, what doesn't work. Um, right now, I feel like the even with the neural structure, I think the community is at the stage where let's throw this at every problem out there, right? Um, I think through the maybe thousand and one papers that come out, you know, a few ideas, nuggets will come out, right? For us, the big idea was this optimization and like how to make it very efficient. Um, I think similar things will pop up as we see more and more researchers explore it, right? And if you ask me what has happened in the last five or 10 years in NLP in the neural world, I would say it's not about BERT or any of these things. It's like attention is a core operation, right? I mean, this sort of has evolved the mechanism of attention, right? I mean, it transcends all these other networks. In the case of BERT, it's like, okay, context matters, right? I think these ideas, these core ideas, you will see, like, I mean, they stick on. And then the network shapes and sizes will change, you know, 101 times, right? I mean, 
today is one thing, tomorrow is a different thing. Did I answer your question? Kind of, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I've been in this field for a long, so I have, uh, so I have uh, you know, sort of a whole this thing about the graph neural network community. So <laughs> before this, and I think it's part of it is like, um, I would say this is another advice I can give as well. Uh, don't test on, I mean, maybe for the sake of papers, it might work, but um, always try to find data sets, which are, I'm not saying like, you know, huge insights, right? These days it's possible, but you should find reasonably sized data sets. If you, we use like, you know, a hundred or a thousand examples and then try to sort of make predictions based on that or generalize conclusions based on that, right? I think it's always uh, misleading. You will see a barrage of like people joining the bandwagon until it hits some roadblock and then you'll say, oh, it doesn't work. Then let's pivot, right? So I, I think it's worth trying it out. Um, you know, and uh, it's easy these days to get access to something that is of reasonable size. Great. Uh, any further questions for the speaker? Um, yeah, I, I have a few more, but I'll let, I can let anyone else go if they want to ask first. Okay, cool. Right. Sorry, I, I have a ton of questions. This was an awesome talk. Um, so one of them was like, there was a lot of work like five or six years ago, I think into like these hierarchical RNNs for like building syntax, like compositionals, like syntax embeddings. Um, and like now that you're mentioning that these GNNs can learn this like asymmetric, uh, like hierarchical relations, I'm wondering if like it could potentially be applied to uh, like syntax, um, like building like phrase embeddings or something like that. Uh, I mean, is there any is there any work on that? Like beyond knowledge graphs, like actually parsing sentences and building those kinds of embeddings. Yeah, um, I think the if you looked at the hyperbolic, I think the one of the motivations even before um, logical operations was to learn hierarchical relationships, right? So, and uh, I think syntax is. I think you make a an interesting point. Like syntax, learning syntactic relationships are like pretty interesting, right? I mean, and this there's a natural sort of a tree-like structure that is already, uh, you know, in the language, you know, like formalism that, uh, you know, we should be able to use. Um, I think absolutely there is an application. Um, I would just say that I think <laughs> parsing has been a, it's an old field, right? I mean, and uh, the work that is going on in syntax is not more like, at least uh, in the contemporary sense of things, uh, not about like syntactic parsing and learning phrase dependency. It's more about, learning syntax as an intermediate representation such that you can do something with it, right? Like for example, in the neural machine translation, right? You want to learn syntactic relationships, not to sort of uh, uh, like actually instantiate this, right? With a tree structure or anything like that. That that work, I think there's a lot of work that has gone on in the NLP field. I mean, uh, from, you know, CFGs to CCGs, so like a lot of stuff going on, right? Um, I think it's more these days about how do you learn the syntactic relationship such that you can actually translate that into a representation which you can use to do downstream end-to-end -end tasks, right? Question answering, translation, et cetera. And I think this still holds. Uh, syntax is an important part of language, right? I mean, whether we instantiate it explicitly or use it implicitly, right? So I think this is the classic debate of whether you should use priors or not, right? I feel like, I mean, if we have knowledge about syntax or if you're able to impute, right? Uh, using that to make our reasoning models and like even machine learning systems, uh, not just smarter, but also more efficient is one way to look at it. Instead of actually throwing in 10X or 100X more data to learn the same concepts, right? I think uh, there's dichotomy on this, right? I mean, some people believe that just learn everything from data. Other people just say, hey, the priors are there in like the domain knowledge is there, let's you know, use those formulas. And so I think that there's like, happy median in between where you use logical formalism constructs and um, either as to inform your representations to do like to reduce your hypothesis at space right so i think that's there's a lot of benefit there yeah so hierarchical yes a lot of interesting work in that uh, direction um uh, not per se i haven't seen anything per se for like generating syntax trees but more like learning syntax or hierarchical representations 
that are then used for some downstream tasks, right? Yeah. There's work in molecular biology as well. So a lot of work in the bioinformatics uh, space that use this. In fact, like the TensorFlow, the framework that I told you about neurosexual learning, they're using it for, you know, protein synthesis and protein, like, you know, sort of learning relationships and different types of molecules, et cetera. Yeah, exactly. That's what I mean, like, like building embeddings based on syntax. I think that that could be a super interesting application. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and that's uh, still, I think, an interesting open field, yeah. Awesome. Thanks. Um, I had a quick question. Um, would you say that you actually get a bit more explainability from your models by using these types of representations? Uh, I would say absolutely. Uh, I would say it's not all the way to the point where we want it. But the the reason uh, the other byproduct actually not byproduct and sometimes it's intentional for using the structure representation and sparse representation is you can actually look at the provenance right you can actually interpret the choices made in the uh, made by the network either in the predictions or even in intermediate layers right because now you can say that uh, my neural network predicted blah right. I can trace back and do the backward propagation for that one example and see, okay, which of those neighbors did it actually attend to, right? Which of the examples contributed to it making this prediction, right? And so these type of reasonings you can actually do because it's uh, grounded in some structure. Um, in the case of smart reply, I think this is a perfect real world example, I can say. This is the only way, uh, and actually in retrospect, we, I think it was the right decision. Like, we were able to take this like really um, you know unstructured space and like sort of narrow down into like hey structured partitions but also capture the semantics right because we wouldn't have been able to do uh, diversity across multiple languages and you know sort of uh, capture sensitivity across and you know cultural nuances etc across different languages etc if you had just relied on hey put everything into the continuous space embeddings and you know, the model will figure it out, right? I mean, in, during the generation process, right? So I think those sort of, um, you make a very good point. I think that's, uh, uh, and, and I think there's more work to be done there. So there's some, I feel like small uh, pockets of work that are starting out for using graph structures for interpretability, but I think there could be more. All right, cool, that's very interesting, thank you. Any uh, further questions for the speaker? Uh... Uh, one more question. Um, so recently there's like, what you were mentioning about how you're able to compute these, like uh, like the graphs, like propagate through the graphs in linear time, that sort of reminded me of like the recent work in transformers where they're trying to get uh, like longer sequences by, by getting it from O of n squared to like linear time. Um, I mean, just what, what do you think about that general body of work of like analyzing transformers as graph neural nets, I guess? Uh, yeah, I think the, that's interesting in the sense that uh, I think the, the sequence, long form sequence to, uh, there's a lot of work, I think different uh, types of approaches, class of approaches on like reducing the, the uh, quadratic complexity. Um, I, I think it is interesting uh, to do the inference and do the interpretability as like, you know, somebody else previously asked, right? Hey, um, which parts of the sequence do, can I just ignore, right? I mean, I actually use the relationships between different parts of the sentence, right? Or the phrase or the document to sort of like, sort of combine them or cluster them such that I don't need to treat them as individual tokens, right? I think that's an interesting way. But there are, I, I would just say, because I mean, like, uh, the compute complexity for transformers is an uh, interesting one. So we actually had, and um, you know, uh, one of the earliest papers on actually reducing the computational complexity of uh, not transformers per se. Uh, this is specifically in the uh, like area of on-device machine learning. Uh, so you, there are two challenges there: one is compute, and one is storage complexity. So using locality-sensitive hashing style, like you know. Pro uh, differentiable locality sensitive hashing uh, projection networks, what we call, there's a whole family of work. There was a work that we just published, in fact, like one of my former interns and colleague, um, uh, Zunita, we just published a work, uh, I think it came out like maybe this earlier this year or something like that, that reduces quadratic to um, linear, actually even sublinear. Um, it's not using graph neural networks. It's basically using what we call this local projection attention. So if you're interested, I think the 
paper should be you can ping me uh, the paper should be up on the website as well it's called performer uh, projection for oh. uh, transform my, so, my friend was actually using that one i i think there's an implementation already on github <laughs> <laughs> this is one of those things. Oh, that's amazing to hear. But <laughs> even I don't know about the implementation. So <laughs> great. Uh, yeah. So this is an example. I think there's a lot of interesting stuff in that direction as well. Because um, you know, um, a it's long form. But I think the I want to make sure that the other part is also highlighted. Right. Using the graph structure, what we did long ago. The, I think uh, I believe in 2011 or something like that. Uh, we had a paper on summarization, which actually used the graph structure there. You're using dependency parslets across the sentence to sort of compute subtrees within the sentence and then like do inference, you know, across different subtrees, right? I mean, and compute a graph structure over that. Um, I think we can now do this even without the dependency pass tree, uh, you know, as an input, right? We should be able to do this like with the kind of representation that we have. So that's an interesting direction, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, great. That's super cool to hear. Okay, maybe we have time for one last quick question if anybody has, because uh, we're at the end of our slot. Uh, Okay, maybe uh, since we're at the end of the slot, let's maybe uh, uh, end the seminar uh, at this point. But uh, so just uh, thank you very much for a really interesting talk on graph learning. So let us uh, please uh, thank the speaker. Okay, thanks again for speaking in our seminar series. Thanks, thanks everyone. Thank yeah, okay. and very cool questions. I think uh, this is a very uh, <laughs> thoughtful questions. Hope you all enjoyed the talk and got more info. If you have any other, please feel free to reach out. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, so we just uh, do you have a couple minutes? Yeah. Uh, hold on, let me see. Okay, okay great. Uh, let me stop the recording one sec.